Welcome, good evening. I'm glad to see you all here. Come in. Um, I hope you're enjoying that next. I'm having a lovely time myself. Uh, the last time I've been on the stage was a year ago. And um, this time, this year, I decided to bring you something different. Uh, we've had a lot of talks uh, at this.next about all kinds of new technologies. We talked about latest C-sharp, C-sharp 0.8. We talked about async enumerators, uh, .NET Core 3.0, Raspberry Pis, all kinds of cool, new, exciting technologies. So the talk that I brought for you guys is a talk about all technologies. I don't want to say ancient technologies, but they're definitely more in the legacy bucket. But uh, these technologies are very important, and I think the reason why most of you are here is because those legacy technologies, and I'm obviously referring to relational databases, are forming the cornerstones, uh, the critical building blocks of your projects today. So please raise your hand if relational databases are something that you work with right now. I would say that it's almost unanimous, right? I think even the people in the next room raise their hand. Um, so clearly you understand what relational databases are because you work with them every day. I know that you do that. Um, Raise your hand if you are using or working with a micro ORM of some sort right now. Okay, so a decent amount of people, I would say maybe 80%. Um, so names like Dapper would probably ring a bell. How many of you are familiar with Dapper? Raise your hand. Okay, a, a good amount of you. Uh, I also assume that you'll probably be familiar with the micro ORM that was sort of hand grown within your company. It's a custom built micro ORM that some smart individual wrote in your company over a weekend and then the home company is using it and now you're stuck with it and you hate it, but that's what you're using, right? I see some smiles in the audience. You probably are realizing exactly the case that I'm talking about. So very briefly about myself, uh, my name is Stan Drapkin. You can see my email there. Uh, I'm a chief technology officer of an IT company that uh, focuses on cybersecurity and uh, regulatory compliance. I'm also an open source library author. Uh, you can see a link to GitHub there. Uh, I've written two uh, open source libraries. The first one is called TinyORM. Uh, it is a .NET micro ORM that will figure prominently into this talk. Uh, the second library is called Inferno, which deals with the uh, cryptography story in .NET. And I've also written a couple of books as well on uh, security-related uh, topics. So enough about myself. Uh, let's talk about the agenda that uh, I have prepared for you. So the first general bucket of material that I want to cover it has a lot to do with database access myths. So those are going to be various stories, various myths that I want to present to you that I think a lot of you might believe in, but they're not really true. So we'll cover those uh, at length. And a lot of them will be mostly conceptual, sort of foundational, high-level concepts. Uh, and then I also want to share with you some practical optimization. So we'll see some code as well, some optimization tricks that I had to engage in as part of uh, uh, building, for example, the micro ORM that I worked on. So without further ado, let's talk about the very first myth. Um, AGO.NET. We all talked about async and specifically uh, within the context of this .next. I'm sure you all know about async and await. I'm not going to bore you with details. But um, a lot of you will at some point be dealing with trying to transfer the concept or the notion and the value of async to the ADO.NET world, to things like Dapper or even classical ADO.NET, which I'm sure a lot of you use right now. So let's look at a very idiomatic ADO.NET code sample. I'm sure you've seen it before. It's your classic you know, MSDN kind of uh, ADO.NET code sample. We start by opening a connection. We get uh, a reader from uh, the command by calling command.execute reader in step number two. Then we do a loop. We call reader.read in a loop. And then for every element, we uh, create a new object, which has as many elements as there are fields. And then we call reader.getValue, and we pass in that data object so that it would get populated with data. And then we process that data somehow in step number four. Here I'm using a simple write line. Uh, to signify processing of some sort. And then finally, if we expect more than one result set, we would uh, call reader.next result set in a loop to process multiple result sets if there are any. So it's a very simple sort of five-step process that I'm sure you're all familiar with. So now that we've seen this idiomatic code sample, let's just try to asyncify it or sort of add async to it. Uh, how hard can that be? So uh, there are four uh, common areas where we see we can employ async uh, because there are suitable methods available in ADO.NET that end with async. And you see those four on your screens, um, async one, two, three, and four. So let's do exactly that. So we will just re rewrite that code. We'll rewrite those four, uh, four areas. And we'll do it by just uh, adding async at the end of those methods, uh, which means that those methods will now return a task, and we will await that task. 
And that's it, we are done. At least it seems like we are done. This code works, this code compiles, this code returns exactly what we expect, except at least it would return exactly what the previous synchronous code was returning, so everything seems to be fine. But is it really the end of the story? Well, it turns out that we can actually improve this code from the efficiency perspective. And the way to do that is to ask ourselves uh, a question, what do those tasks, those, those four tasks that we are now creating, what do they return? So let's deal with them one by one. So the very first task that we get by calling connection.openAsync, is that task complete or incomplete? How many of you think that that task will be complete? Very few hands. How many of you think that that task will be incomplete? I would say a lot more hands. So the reality is that this task will be completed. And I think that a lot of you might actually be surprised by that. So the obvious question is why? Why would it be completed? And the reason for why that task would actually be completed is our good old friend from the ADO.NET days, connection pooling. So connection pooling is something that's available in ADO.NET and it's actually uh, enabled by default. So it's always there and for a good reason, something that you should always be using. And under connection pooling, the connection that you're going to get in the vast majority of cases will already be opened. It will be a pre-opened pooled connection. So other than the very first invocation, the other 99.9% .9 of the calls to open I think will give you a completed task. What about the second line, uh, where we call uh, command.executereader async? Uh, would that be complete or incomplete? Complete? Incomplete? So a lot of you think it's going to be incomplete. That's right, it's going to be incomplete. And for obvious reasons, that's the call that actually makes its way to the database, where a time-consuming task is going to happen, and then the database will take its own time, and then it will return the results, so we have to wait for it. What about the other, the other two uh, cases, the T3 and T4, where we're calling a method on reader, reader async and reader.next result async? Uh, is it going to be complete? Incomplete? Fewer hands. So again, it's going to be completed. And again, for uh, a good reason, because in the vast majority of the cases, again, by the time we are done with uh, the execute reader, the results are already going to be sitting in memory. Whether it's a single result set or multiple result sets that we are dealing with, the results are already going to be sitting in the memory of your client and readily available, and those tasks will also be completed. So if you want to extract maximum efficiency out of this code, it turns out that we only want to use async in one place. We only want to use async for the task that's going to be incomplete. And the other three invocations are better off uh, with the old former synchronous code. So just to summarize the async invocations or optimizations that uh, I've covered, uh, for mostly completed tasks, you're going to be dealing with the state machine task allocation, which itself will take at least 40 bytes for the state machine alone. On top of the state machine, you're also going to be dealing with various state capture and field assignment, which a lot of you might not be realizing because it's not that obvious. And the reason why that, that state capture and field assignment happens is because it really depends on what your code is doing, and it really depends on closures. So your closures might be closing over a large portion of the stack, which might include all kinds of fat and chunky variables. And copying those fat and chunky variables into the state so that that state would be restored later on is an expensive operation. Then you're also looking at the get the waiter call, which is not free, and then there is also a call to the is completed property, which is also a call in .NET. So all of those things, they take time and they have a cost. So uh, if you're dealing with mostly uh, completed tasks, it makes no sense to wait them and you're better off with the async version. For mostly incomplete tasks, uh, of course, the async version uh, might be preferred. So let's move on. And uh, the second myth I want to cover is that database connections must be there. All those database connections, you love them dearly. You probably can't imagine your life without database connections. Um, what else is there if database connections are not available to you? Um, so let me give you a different perspective. It turns out that connections are actually an anti-pattern. And unfortunately, unfortunately, most micro RMs, the, the ones that you are probably exposed to and the ones that you're using right now, they're all connection oriented. So just as an example, Dapper itself is just a bunch of extensions to an IDB connection interface. So database connections are fundamentally an inherent part of the design of Dapper. Uh, you can't use Dapper without using database connections. And we all continue to create open, close, track, dispose connections. We continue to pass connections through layers and context. And why do we keep doing all this? And I think the answer to that question is, that we've been all conditioned to treat connections as a norm, as a given. And the reason for it is that we've all had to endure 17 years of ADO.NET patterns, which have all been hammered into us. And 17 years is a long time. But it turns out that connections are just a low-level implementation detail. They must be hidden 
and they must be transparent. Just like an async state machine, which you would never write by hand, right? Uh, it should be done by tooling, by the compiler in the case of a state machine or by some other tooling, like a library. So the message here is that ideally what you want is you want to stop managing connections, stop doing all this dirty work if you value your time. It's also worth mentioning that uh, from the high-level database concept perspective, the high-level concept is a transaction, not a connection. Connection has never been a high-level database concept. Turns out that connections should be ideally auto-created and auto-disposed as needed, as necessary. They should also be auto-enlisted in transactions, again, as needed and as necessary. And if you're wondering whether there is some practical tool, some practical library that will allow you to do all that, so that this is not just a theoretical wish list, uh, the answer is yes. And you can, for example, look at uh, something like TinyORM, uh, which is one example of a completely connection-free micro-ORM. So if you're trying or if you're using TinyORM, connections are not even a thing in your world. You never think or worry about connections at all. Myth number three, you must have POCOs. All those precious POCOs, you love them dearly. You likely don't even imagine your life without POCOs. I mean, what else would you want out of a micro RM if you don't get your POCOs? I'm obviously talking about plain old C-sharp objects. So let me give you an alternative. So let me introduce you to a data transfer object, or a DTO. And in order to understand it, let's again revisit a portion of our idiomatic IDO.NET um, IDO code. So we, we iterate over the reader.read, uh, read, so we run this while loop and we create this object to rate data uh, of length field count, and then we call reader.getValues to populate data. So data now contains all the data that we actually want for, for a role, for a given role. So that data itself can easily be stored inside a simple container, or it can even be a container itself, and that simple container can be our data transfer object, uh, which will contain the data. So let's compare these two concepts of POCO and the DTO, and let's try them in practice and see how it feels. So on the left, you see a classic POCO object. So here I have a class cat with three properties, ID, name, and age of type GUID, string, and int. Very classic, very simple. On the right-hand side, you can see the DTO equivalent. So it implements a dynamic interface because some of the calls will probably want to be dynamic. And it has our data object array in it. And it also has an additional class called RS schema, where RS schema uh, stands for result set schema. It's just a meta class that describes the meta information like field names. And this DTO design is very similar actually to what Dapper does. So let's try to use both of them. So again, we will create a list of cats. So on the POCO side, we have a list of cats. On the DTO side, we have a list of DTOs. And then we get the first value, the zero value, and uh, uh, it's going to be C. And then uh, on the POCO side, we're going to get an ID out of it by calling C.ID, and we get a strongly typed uh, lowercase ID out of it. Uh, very simple. On the DTO side, you see slightly more code, but the only reason for it is that I'm showing you three different ways of doing it. So in practice, you don't need all three, you need just one of them, but I just wanted to show you the flexibility. So the first two are simple indexers. So a string indexer and an int indexer to get the GUID ID one and two out. The third method is a dynamic method. So in order to get the same value out dynamically, we first have to assign cat zero to this dynamic helper D, and then we do D.ID and assign it to ID three, and D.ID, the invocation itself, is going to be a dynamic call. So I have three different ways of getting the data out of the TO, at least. Uh, but the data is readily available, readily consumable. You can do the exact same things that you would normally do with the POCO. So to summarize the POCO versus DTO, POCOs are nice, but they're costly, uh, and they're definitely not a must-have. So the reason why POCOs are costly is that the creation of this data array, it didn't go anywhere. So when we were building our POCOs, the data array was created anyway, but on top of that data array creation, you also had to create an additional POCO object and then materialize every single property of that POCO object, uh, which is expensive. Um, so DTOs can work just as well. We've just seen a code sample where I can get the exact same data out as I could with the POCO. So the next question might be, when and why should you prefer POCOs to DTOs? So keep that question in mind, we'll answer it later. The next myth, myth number four, that micro ORMs need a lot of APIs. So some of the libraries that you've already told me uh, you've used, uh, like Dapper, if you start looking at their API surface area, you'll count over 20 different API methods. So some of them are shown. That's a lot of APIs. If you look at something like Entity Framework Core, which I also assume a lot of you have either tried or are using right now, you're also looking at over 20 different methods, which you have to understand and learn. If you look at something like ORM Lite, uh, which by the way is a commercial micro ORM, and you start counting, you'll count 20, and then you keep counting, 
and then you count 40, and you continue counting, and then you count 77, and then you realize that what you've just counted is just the async versions. And then there are over 60 additional sync versions. So if you add it all together, you'll be looking at over 137 different API methods. So that's insanity, that's madness, I think. And if that's the path that you have to travel, then I imagine your development teams look probably something like this, where um, the whole team has to look at an insane API surface area and read countless pages of documentation and struggle with all the methods that, uh, that are exposed. So that's probably not a good path to follow. So as an alternative, uh, something like Tiny ORM, for example, exposes only two methods. There are just two APIs. Query async that returns a single result set and query multiple async for multiple result sets. Uh, so in terms of signatures, uh, query async returns obviously a task of list of row store and query multiple async returns a list of list of row store. And row store in this case is just what Tiny ORM calls its DTO. So row store is just a DTO data transfer object. The next myth. Dapper is easy to use. I assume that all of those uh, who raised their hand when I asked whether you're using Dapper probably followed this myth as your motivation to start using Dapper, or at least to start testing it. You picked it because it was easy for you to, uh, to get started. So let's look at this myth in detail. So let's start with a simple sim uh, SQL statement. This SQL statement returns two things. A name, which is going to be a parameterized name. It's just going to be some string value where we will pass it into this function and then it will return it back to us. So we give it something and it gives us the exact same, same thing back. And the second thing that it returns is just the isolation level of the query. We just want to know what's the isolation level that this particular query is running under. So we're not querying any databases or any tables, very simple query. So armed with this uh, simple query, you'll send this query to Dapper using the most simplistic Dapper access method, connection.querySync. So we send that SQL from the previous slide into this method. And we get, or we provide the parameterized value for our name parameter. So here I'm providing Hector. And we execute it, we run it, and it runs. And uh, the name returned as Hector as we expected, and the isolation level is two, uh, which means that it's read committed. So, so far, so good. It's doing exactly what we expected to do. So let's complicate it slightly. So then we realize that we want to run this thing in a transaction, as I assume most of you do, because most of our systems are transactional. Uh, so again, we follow the idiomatic ADO.NET approach and we wrap the whole thing in a using block with the transaction scope, very idiomatic thing to do. Uh, and then before we exit the using block, we have to do transaction scope.complete. And these are the only changes that we make. And then we rerun this thing. So when we run this, we now get an invalid operation exception. A transaction scope must be disposed on the same thread that it was created. So other than the fact that this is broken English and Max should really fix it, we really have to deal with the exception. So we can't proceed until we do something with the exception. Uh, the way to get rid of the exception is non-intuitive. Uh, we actually are required to pass this new enumeration flag into the constructor of transaction scope, transaction scope async flow option dot enabled, very conveniently named. Uh, but once we do that, the exception is gone and the query runs and we get our Hector back. But a funny thing happens, or maybe it's not so funny anymore. Uh, the isolation level got mysteriously changed or flipped from two read committed to serializable. And I assume that most of you know that running in production under serializable isolation level is probably not a good idea. And even if it was a good idea, the very fact that the isolation level got mysteriously flipped underneath you is not, is not a very comforting thought. Um, so just to summarize Dapper, uh, Dapper is just ADO.NET with less code. That's all it is. All the ADO.NET problems that are there by design, they're still there. You're still dealing with old API paradigms and the same old ADO.NET low-level concepts. So if you're using Dapper, none of that goes away. It's still there. But at the very least, Dapper is fast. I mean, you're probably thinking, say what you want, but at least I get my performance, right? At least Dapper is fast. I'm going to go at a blazing speed just by using Dapper, right? Next myth, Dapper is fast. So. In order to assess Dapper and all the other micro RMs, we need a benchmark. So the benchmark that I decided to use is a benchmark called Raw, da Raw Data Access Bencher. It's an existing benchmark. Uh, it's available on GitHub at the link that you see. It's a reasonably mature benchmark. It hails all the way from 2013. It comes with over 14 different tests for different micro RMs. Uh, the benchmark itself is sort of crude. It's not very precise or accurate, but for comparison purposes, for my purposes, it's perfectly okay. 
Uh, it's authored by uh, a guy named Franz Buma, who also coincidentally happens to be the author of a commercial uh, ORM for .NET called LLBL Gen Pro, and I think his primary motivation was to showcase the performance of LLBL Gen, but the benchmark is not biased in any way toward his particular product. So I tested it uh, on my laptop uh, on .NET 4.7.2, 64-bit uh, Windows 10 latest, and I used all the latest versions of the micro ORMs uh, that were available on Nougat. Uh, .NET 4.8 was not yet available uh, when I was testing it, or that it was available, but I was not available. I was on vacation. Um, so let's look at the first benchmark. So the first benchmark that I'm showing you right now is a, um, is a timing benchmark that fetches over 30,000 rows from the database. And for every row, for all of those 30 plus thousand, it converts every row into a POCO. So essentially what that benchmark stress tests is the capacity of the micro ORM to do POCO materialization in the fastest possible manner. This benchmark is not necessarily realistic because a realistic case is not a case where you're fetching 30,000 rows from the database. Uh, at least if that's your realistic case, then you're probably doing something uh, weird. So when you look at a benchmark like that, we can already draw some observations. Uh, so the way you interpret this graph is that the purple bars are the milliseconds, and uh, you see this vertical black line uh, that shows our baseline. So our baseline is essentially the winner of this benchmark, and right now the winner happens to be the hand-coded ADO.net for obvious reasons. Um, that's the fastest way to get, to get everything uh, materialized. And everything to the right of that dotted line represents an overhead compared to the baseline. And that overhead is that percentage that you see there. So ADO.net has zero percentage overhead, and everything else has a corresponding uh, percentage overhead. So that's how you read this graph. So handcode.adio.net uh, hand is going to be a winner here. Uh, but what I'd like to do here is I'd like to remove handcode.adio.net from this comparison because I wanted to compare just micro ORMs. Uh, and handcode.adio.net is not a micro ORM. It's the very thing that we're trying to avoid because nobody wants to hard code all this materialization. So uh, as we've seen, uh, the winner was uh, adio.net. And on the other end of the spectrum, just in case you're curious, we often find it on that end of the spectrum, we can see NG framework. That's all I'm going to say about the entity framework. Uh, or maybe I'll say one more thing. So it's not just slow, it's ridiculously slow. It's stratospherically slow. Um, but let's uh, look at the same set of numbers now without the context of ADO.net. So now you're looking at the exact same set of numbers, but now I'm baselining it to the first available micro ORM. So let's find Dapper in this picture. So you can probably see Dapper there closer to the bottom. And Dapper has roughly around 19% overhead compared to the fastest alternative micro ORM. So that's not particularly fast. Uh, Entity framework is the same old, familiar, predictable 150% overhead. Um, I don't think I'm going to surprise anybody with that number. So let's look at a different benchmark. So this particular benchmark is a benchmark of first query timings. So a first query is the query that a micro ORM encounters for the very first time. Essentially, it is a benchmark of a cold, test, uh, of a cold start. Um, when every micro ORM runs that query and runs its or warms up its internal caches and its internal mechanisms for the very first time. So when you look at that uh, benchmark again, let's try to find my uh, Dapper. Uh, Dapper doesn't surprise. It still shows us the same 19% uh, overhead. But uh, sorry, more interestingly, if you look at the bottom of that graph, um, I wanted to highlight the performance of NGT framework uh, because it's unusually bad. I mean, it's usually bad, but in this case, it's unusually bad. So the numbers that you see there in red represent the millisecond counts. So to run a simple select hello world query uh, for entity framework core on the very first run takes over two seconds. That's what the number represents. And another micro ORM takes over three seconds to run a query like that. So that's not just bad, it's just unusable. It's beyond bad, uh, especially in the world of serverless. And by the way, we had a talk on serverless at this dot next. Uh, serverless seems like, you know, like the future, and uh, the more uh, our environments become serverless, this notion of cold start becomes more and more important. Almost every start at some point will be the cold start, especially in a serverless environment where you have to deal with Lambda functions and Azure functions and Google Cloud functions and functions as a service and all of those ser serverless concepts. So to summarize Dapper, we've seen that Dapper can be up to 20% slower than the fastest micro ORM. Uh, on the graphs uh, that, uh, that you've seen, uh, I've shown you tiny ORM in two different stages or modes, a one stage and a two stage. So what's that? We haven't really covered that yet. Uh, so keep that question in mind. We will cover that later. But at the very least, even if it's not dapper, uh, then we always have our good old ADO.NET. ADO.NET is fast, right? 
you can't really beat that. ADO.NET is our baseline. That's the very thing that you cannot go below. You cannot beat ADO.NET, right? Let's talk about the next myth. You can't beat ADO.NET. Let me show you another benchmark. Um, this particular benchmark is a single row benchmark. So essentially, it is the equivalent of uh, select top one star. It returns just a single row, and then it materializes that row. So this is more representative of the typical case of the typical query that you're dealing with. In other words, it's a query that returns just a few rows, or a query that returns just a single row. So this is supposed to be blazing fast. It's supposed to be as fast as you normally have queries running in production. Um, so Dapper, again, does not surprise. It's some there, somewhere there in the middle with 16% overhead. Entity framework core is its usual self. And um, the interesting thing, though, is the leaders of the benchmark. So if you look at the winners, uh, you no longer see ADO.NET as the winner. Uh, TinyORM is actually the winner in this particular benchmark. And compared to TinyORM, hand-coded ADO.NET has a 4% overhead. So how is that possible? In what world does that make sense? Maybe the benchmark is wrong. Maybe the benchmarking code is flawed. That's a valid assumption. But I assure you that the benchmark is not wrong, it's not flawed, the numbers are accurate, and ADO.NET indeed shows a 4% overhead. So the trick here is again our good old friend ADO.NET connection pooling. So the way ADO.NET connection pooling works uh, is that it's just a cache or a normal pool. And normally when we're dealing with a cache and a pool, you expect two commands, two method calls, two operations. One to get some valuable resource from the pool for you to use and do something meaningful with and another call to return it or to release it back to the pool. And usually those calls are just static methods so that they're blazing fast and they operate as fast as, as, as they can possibly operate. But that's not the way you lease a SQL connection from ADO.NET pool. There is no ADO.NET pool dot lease connection or anything like that. The way you lease a SQL connection from ADO.NET pool is by creating a brand new SQL connection object, by newing it, by invoking its constructor. I mean, that's the design of ADO.NET. That's what you have to deal with. So the trick that I'm using here is that um, instead of going to the ADO.NET pool all the time, instead of deferring it uh, to the ADO.NET pool all the time, I've written my own transaction-aware connection cache, where, the, where instead of going to the ADO.NET, I'm just caching the connection myself for as long as it needs to be cached, and in most of the cases, uh, it's uh, the duration of the transaction. So for the, as long as the transaction is alive, it makes sense to keep the connection alive, and I'm just doing it uh, in a custom code rather than deferring that to the ADO.NET connection pool. And the example of such a connection cache uh, is actually found in the tiny ORM uh, source code that's available on GitHub. But the end result here is that you would get uh, faster connection setup and connection teardown if you do it yourself rather than delegating to ADO.NET all the time. The next myth, that there is only one micro ORM approach. Uh, so you're probably very puzzled by this statement because you are only aware of one micro ORM approach, or maybe to put it differently, you were never aware that there is more than one. You're just using the one and only micro ORM approach that you've seen before, that you've used before. So what do I mean by multiple approaches? Turns out that there are at least three distinct and useful, distinctly useful approaches uh, that's important to know and understand. And uh, I've given them names. I'm calling them a one stage, a half stage, and a two stage approach. So let's discuss them uh, one by one. So we'll start with the one-stage approach. That's the one that you should be familiar with. That's the one that you're using right now. So in a one-stage approach, we follow a sequence of six steps. We connect to the database. We send the query. We get the data reader out. We loop over that data reader, uh, step number four, and we construct our list of POCOs out of that data reader. Then we disconnect, and we finally return our list of POCOs out of the, uh, out of the pipeline. Six steps, very simple, that's what you're used to, that's what Dapper does, that's what ADO.NET Framework does, that's what your custom build over the weekend micro ORM does, uh, they all do this. So let's compare that with the half stage. They're very similar with one subtle difference. So again, we also connect, we send the query, we get the data reader, but in step four, rather than building a list of POCOs, we now build a list of DTOs. Step five, we disconnect, as usual, and in step six, we return a list of DTOs instead of a list of POCOs. So that's the only subtle difference here. Uh, so the takeaway here is that the return types differ between one stage and half stage. So for one stage, we're returning a list of POCOs. For half stage, we're returning a list of DTOs. That's the only difference. So now that we have an understanding of half stage, let's talk about two stage. So again, on the left, you see the one stage that we've just discussed. You should be familiar with that one. 
And for a two-stage approach, there is one extra step. So again, we connect, we send the query, we get the data reader. Step four, we create a list of DTOs rather than POCO, so it's very similar to a half stage. Step five, we disconnect. Step six is something weird. In step six, we take that uh, freshly built list of POCOs that we obtain after the disconnection, and we convert it, we engage in explicit conversion to a list of POCOs. And in step seven, we return that list of POCOs. So the takeaways here are that step or uh, stage two is longer, obviously, because there is this explicit additional extra step, step six, but the return types are the same. Both one stage and two stage return uh, lists of POCOs. So now that we have a conceptual understanding of the three different stages, let's try to compare and contrast them. So I've prepared the, this matrix for you. In the columns there, you see the three stages, the one stage, the half stage, and the two stage. Over the stage names, you see the uh, object types that are returned. So one stage and two stage return POCOs. Half stage will return DTOs. And uh, uh, horizontally uh, in rows, you see the various criteria that may, may or may not be important for your use cases. So let's go through that criteria and uh, see what, what kind of uh, you know, uh, pros and cons do we get. So the first criteria is client performance. So let's say that the most important thing to you, to your application, is client performance. You're willing to sacrifice everything else as long as you get client-side performance at all costs. So if it is client-side performance that you want, the winner here is clearly the half-stage approach. Because in the half-stage approach, you're going to be returning a list of DTOs, and as we've discussed, building that list of DTOs essentially skips materialization. Uh, or the expensive part of materialization. So it's going to perform better, it's going to run faster. So moving on, let's talk about memory efficiency. So memory efficiency might be another very important consideration. And if you are particularly concerned about memory efficiency, again, the half-stage approach wins, because not only is building DTOs faster than building POCOs, but DTOs are also going to be more memory efficient, uh, because they do not engage in this expensive POCO object construction, and uh, uh, they're not as memory heavy. So moving on, the third criteria uh, is server efficiency. And it's there in bold because I believe it is the most important criteria, at least it is the most important criteria by default. If you're unsure uh, what the most important criteria is, that's your default choice. Your default choice should always be optimizing server-side efficiency, not client-side performance, but server-side efficiency. So if the server-side efficiency that you're after, the Winners here are the half stage and the two stage for a very simple reason. Uh, the half stage and the two stage engage in fast disconnect. They connect to the database, get a list of DTOs, which is fast to construct, and then they disconnect right away so that server is no longer concerned about anything. And only then do they engage in all the subsequent steps. Compare to that to a, uh, to a one stage approach where in the one stage approach, you're materializing that list of POCOs while you're still maintaining and keeping the connection to the database open and alive and you're still holding and hogging all the database resources without releasing them. So you're engaging in this POCO construction. Some of the constructors might be complex. I've seen people code, you know, web access code in, in their constructors, you know, weird things like that. So you can no longer necessarily assume that, uh, you know, your constructors are going to be as fast as, as, as a default constructor. So stage one is going to be the loser for server-side efficiency, and the other two stages, the half stage and the two stage, are going to win. What if you care about great multi-results at APIs? What if you're dealing with APIs that frequently return multiple result sets? So let's say you need to process uh, a query that's going to return you a list of dogs, a list of cats, a list of birds, a list of butterflies, whatever. Uh, and you want to have nice, eloquent APIs with C-sharp destructuring with all this nice syntactic sugar. So if you want something like that, you need a list of list of DTO or list of list of row store. And that's the kind of API that's only available with a two-stage approach. So if that's something that's very important to you, the multi-result set uh, niceties, then you will greatly prefer the two-stage approach to all the others. And finally, what if it is the POCUS that you want? You don't care about anything else, you just want your POCUS. You want your precious POCUS. And uh, if POCUS you want, then you have to look at the stages, obviously, that return POCUS. So we have the one stage that returns a list of POCUS and the two stage that returns a list of POCUS. The reason why I have a yellow star there for two stage is because the two stage does return POCUS, but with the caveat that the POCUS that it's going to construct and return to you will take a little extra time to be returned. And the reason for that extra time, um, or tiny amount of extra time, is because it first has to build a list of DTOs then it will disconnect from the database, and then it will engage in this explicit conversion of a list of DTOs to a list of POCOs. Now, practically, you will never feel that additional overhead 
uh, this additional performance overhead because again you're not returning 30,000 rows from the database you're returning maybe 100 uh, so that overhead is going to be minimal on the uh, performance metrics that I've shown you on earlier slides uh, some of you might have noticed that uh, for example tiny ORM in a two-stage approach is faster than any commercial ORM in one stage approach so just to show you that there is a way to 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 write correct um, fast code that, uh, that, that will negate any performance, any perception of uh, performance drawbacks. So hopefully this matrix provides you with some insights, with some tools to uh, decide which particular approach, whether it's one stage, half stage, or two stage, makes the most sense for your particular use case. So moving on, another important concept that uh, I thought I'd share with you is what I call giving it back. So we had a lot of talk about async in this presentation and past.next presentation. You've all been asynced to death, am I right? Uh, so one important perspective on async that I thought I would share with you is that async is essentially screaming at you and saying, give me back my threads, I'm not waiting for a silly I.O. I wanted to write stupid I.O, but I changed it to silly I.O. Um, another parallel concept to this concept of async is the concept that I just discussed, which is the concept of a two-stage fast disconnect. So under two-stage fast disconnect, it's also screaming at you, and it's essentially saying, give me back my database resources. I'm not waiting for a stupid materialization. So as you can see now, these two concepts are very much related. Uh, there is a clear parallel between the two. And if you're already uh, subscribed to the notion of async, if you already know that async is a good thing to do in your particular scenario, uh, where it's a trade-off, you'd rather prefer, let's say, uh, scalability on the thread pool side to performance on the client on the client side, uh, you would also probably subscribe to a two-stage fast disconnect as a good worthwhile thing to do. If you think that async is a worthwhile good thing to do, you will probably be aligned with the notion that two-stage fast disconnect is in the same bucket. It's also a very good and a very worthwhile thing to pursue. So let me switch gears a little bit. So far we've talked a lot about concepts which were a bit sort of uh, high level and theoretical. So let me share some maybe low level, more practical optimization tricks with you uh, that um, I had to use in order to build or to, in order to optimize rather tiny ORM. So the first thing that I wanted to show you that I thought it would be interesting to share with you uh, is uh, how I built a faster DTO in uh, tiny ORM. So in order to understand this, we need to start with how a DTO is currently implemented in something like Dapper. So I'm just using Dapper here as an example, and it is an accurate example, but other micro ORMs do almost the same thing. So we have a class uh, Dapper DTO, which has our familiar object array data, and there's also this class RS schema. Uh, schema. Uh, RS stands for result set. So let's understand that uh, result set schema class a little bit better. So that class, uh, it's just another container of metadata. It has a string array field names, which contains the names of the fields that there are, uh, uh, the values of which are sitting within data. And it also has a lookup dictionary for looking up a particular name and finding its order or its position uh, in, the, in the data array. So again, a very simple class. So now that we have that understanding, let's compare it with what uh, Tiny ORM does. So if you look at what Tiny ORM does, you should probably notice two important differences. So the first striking difference is that while Dapper DTO is a class, Tiny ORM DTO is a struct. So that's one important difference. And the second important difference is that uh, Dapper DTO has this RSS schema object or pointer to this object, but it's not present in Tiny ORM. So that creates two obvious questions. How is the change that Tiny ORM makes, this struct change, how is that any better? And the second change, is, or the second question is, where did the schema go? So let's answer those questions one by one. So first, let's take a look at the DTO memory layout for a Dapper DTO. Uh, so Dapper DTO is an object. So because it's an object, it has an 8-byte object header. It has an 8-byte method table pointer, 8-byte pointer to an object array of data, and an 8-byte pointer to schema of type RSS schema. So altogether, 32 bytes. Very simple. Let's contrast that again with the tiny ORM DTO struct. Because it's a struct, it doesn't have a header or a table pointer. Uh, schema is somehow mysteriously gone. And the only thing we're left with is just the eight bytes uh, for the uh, data pointer. So that's an eight versus 32 improvement. Pretty significant. So let's visualize it. So let's say we have an array of five uh, tiny ORM uh, DTO elements. So this array is laid out in memory visually the way, uh, the way you see there in the green. Uh, so each cell is occupying exactly eight bytes, as we've seen. Uh, it's just a simple single array of struct, and it has great memory locality. 
So how does the picture look for the, uh, for the Dapper equivalent? So again, we have an array of Dapper DTO with five elements, uh, shown there in light blue. Uh, the array itself is the same. It's five elements clustered together. Each cell contains eight, but that eight is no longer a structure, it's a pointer. It's a pointer to another object that we've just seen. And that other separate object occupies an additional 32 bytes. So uh, not only are we creating additional objects that have to be garbage collected later, so that creates additional memory pressure, uh, because those objects are small and they have to be created frequently, it also leads to memory fragmentation as well. So altogether, if you total all the, all the bytes allocated for the TinyRM case, and if you total all the bytes allocated for the Dapper case, you're looking at a 5x improvement in terms of memory footprint. So we answered the first question, let's try to answer the second question. Where did the schema go? And in order to answer this question, again, we need to look at this idiomatic ADO.NET code, or rather a portion, a section of that code where we are constructing our data object. So again, we are looping over the reader, and for every row within the reader, we are creating the data object array uh, by allocating a brand new object array that has as many elements as there are uh, field counts, or as the field count property indicates, and then we call reader.getValue to populate the data uh, with actual values. So the trick that I'm employing is by simply adding one, by incrementing the field count by one, by creating another empty free cell at the very end of that array, that cell will have a type of object, which is very convenient, and I can store the RSS schema object directly into that very last cell, right? So storing it right there at the end of the data array uh, saves me uh, or allows me to avoid creating uh, or uh, tracking the pointer to this, to this object within the structure, which makes my structures much smaller. So another optimization trick that I thought you might find interesting um, is a case where I was trying to optimize the iteration or the iteration performance of uh, iterating over list of T. So in my particular use case, I thought that you know, the current or the default uh, way of iterating list T that's available on the net was too slow, and I was trying, I was looking for ways to improve it, to optimize it somehow. Uh, so part of the motivation for me here was that if you remember my description of a two-stage approach, I first had to build uh, a list of DTOs, and then that list of DTOs had to be converted to a list of POCOs. So this conversion requires iteration over the initial list, uh, or somehow this iteration needs to be as fast as we can possibly make it. So one way to make this iteration fast is to employ, uh, uh, for example, parallelism to parallelize the work, but that's not what I want to talk about. I want to talk about improving the speed of iteration. So let's look at the list. So uh, list itself has this internal array of T uh, field called items or underscore items. And that's what I ideally want to access because accessing uh, and iterating over the native, .NET native uh, array is probably the fastest data structure to iterate in .NET. It produces the, the, the fastest, the most efficient compiling, uh, compiler code. Um, so the obvious idea here, whenever we want to access something that's private, uh, is to use reflection, right? And that's the first thing that I tried. But unfortunately, reflection is not going to be fast enough uh, in this particular case. Even if you use all the magic, all the black magic in the world to try to make reflection as fast as we can possibly make it, if you try to compile it into delegates, none of that will have any meaningful effect for us because reflection overhead will reduce any performance gains that we will get out of uh, iterating the native array rather than using the, uh, the list indexer. So one other trick that I decided to use is to find an equivalent object that's... Uh, equivalent in terms of its memory layout to a list of T. So on the left-hand side, you see a list of T, which has a very first field uh, of type object. Here, it's not just object, it's a specific object. It's a T array, but it is an object because arrays are objects in .NET. And another equivalent class that I was able to find in .NET without creating or declaring my own class is a class tuple object. So this is the standard tuple object that's already available in .NET. So in a tuple object, uh, we know that the very first field will be called item one, and it is a public field. So that's the important difference. It's private in case of list T, and it is public in case of uh, tuple object. So the trick that I'm thinking of is that if I could somehow superimpose the memory layouts of both of those objects, one on top of the other, I would be able to extract these private items via the public item one. So that's the high level strategy. So what I'm thinking about is I'm thinking about unionizing or creating a union of those two in-memory layouts, and then, as I said, extracting this internal underscore items via the public item one. So let's try to implement something like that. And in order to do that, we need to build a union structure. So this is a classic union structure in .NET. It's a structure, obviously. It has an explicit memory layout. It has two fields. It has uh, the first field called some list. It is of type object. Ideally, it should be of type T, but unfortunately in .NET, uh, structures cannot be, uh, cannot use a generic 
so it has to be object. And the second field is a field uh, called list accessor. That's the one that we'll be using to extract the data out. Uh, the type of it is uh, tuple of object. And both of those fields have a field offset that starts at zero. So that's our classic union structure in .NET. So let's try to leverage it. And in order to do it, we will build a simple helper method called getListItemsArray. It will be uh, receiving our list of T as an incoming parameter. Here it's called list. And uh, in order to understand the code, first look at the middle of the code there. We are creating our list union structure there by saying new list union. And then we're going to assign our list to the first property within this union called some list of type object. And then we will, once we construct it, once we knew it, we will immediately extract it out via the list accessor property, via that second property, which is of type tuple object, by the way. So once we extract it out, we now have access to this public item one property, which will give us an object. Uh, but we don't want an object, we want an array of T. So then we simply cast it to an array of T and we return it. Very simple. So let's try to use it and see if it works. So we're going to create a list of uh, three values, A, B, C. We call our get list items array helper. We pass it the list. Uh, we get a native array of strings. And then for each value in this array, we simply write it out. And we get four values back. The first three are set to A, B, C as we expected. And the fourth one is null, which is exactly what we expected. Because as you know, when the list is constructing um, uh, its internal properties, uh, the internal array is initialized to a value of four. It's, it's created with four items by default. So it works beautifully. So let me give you a summary of some takeaways that I want you to have after this talk. I want you to think really hard about what a good micro-ORM should be. And I have some suggestions for you. So I suggest that a good micro-ORM should not be based on legacy ADO.NET paradigms or concepts. A good micro-ORM should ideally be connection-free. In other words, I want you all to stop doing connection management by hand. Save yourself the time, the effort, and the aggravation. A good micro-ORM should be fast. And for the record, Dapper was not fast, as we've seen. A good micro-ORM should ideally be doing fast disconnect, because server-side scalability is, in the vast majority of cases, way more important than anything else. A good micro-ORM should ideally be easy to use, which means that it should have very few sane APIs, and ideally, maybe two or one. And a good micro-ORM ideally should be tiny, free, and maintainable. And just to give you a sense of what I mean when I say tiny, if you were to ask me how many lines of code there are in a tiny ORM, the answer is seven, 700, just 700 lines. I've seen some of you doing the exercises in the hallways. I think you've written more than 700 lines when you were trying to win some contests or win a pen or something. Um, so that, that list of uh, uh, desirable features or characteristics, is that all? Is that all we want from a good micro ORM? Turns out that the answer is no. There are many other advanced features that we can talk about at length, such as transaction, auto-abort, change tracking, bulk operations, batch operations, streaming grids, identity tracking, call set tracking, parallel transactions, query building, um, table value parameter support, result destructuring, et cetera, et cetera. So my goal for showing you this is not to talk at length about any of those things, but to simply explain to you that even if you're not using any of those features, if you're not in need of any of those features today, you will need some of them, or most of them, or even all of them tomorrow. At some point, you will need some or a decent subset of these features uh, at some point in your professional life or in your project. And uh, the important thing to realize is that by choosing a micro ORM, you should not compromise. So it's not like if you choose a micro ORM as opposed to a big, well-advertised ORM like Entity Framework, you will be lacking some of those features. So for example, tiny ORM supports all of that out of the box. So all of that is available in the same 700 lines of code. So you don't have to compromise, you get all of that. Um, and don't feel like you have to settle for something inferior. Uh, that concludes my main talk, uh, but I think I have 11 more minutes. There is one more thing uh, that I wanted to talk to you about because I have time. Uh, I've prepared two bonus myths for you that I thought you might enjoy. Uh, they are number nine and 10 on the list. So number nine, and this is specifically within the context of SQL Server, I assume that a lot of you are uh, exposed to SQL Server in some way, shape, or form. So in SQL Server, when it comes to strings, there are two types. There is an nvar char or variable length strings. Uh, there is an nvar char type and a var char type. And there is a common belief that nvar char type takes twice as much space as var char, because nvar char type is Unicode, and Unicode normally stores uh, two bytes per character rather than one. This is a myth. This is not correct. And if you're interested in details, uh, please welcome to the discussion zone and I'll cover that. 
Uh, myth number 10 has to do with GUIDs, or rather clustering on GUIDs. So there is this common popular belief that um, clustering databases on uh, GUID or unique identifier uh, keys, columns, primary keys, that this approach is bad. And the number one reason cited for why this approach is bad is that many people believe that this causes fragmentation. That's not technically accurate. Uh, and for example, in my own solutions, in my own company, uh, or the company that I work for, uh, all of our primary keys are clustered GUIDs. So if you're interested in finding out how we are dealing with a scenario like that and why we are not afraid of fragmentation, and the reason why we're not afraid of fragmentation is because we do not have fragmentation, it does not cause fragmentation. If this is something that you're interested in, uh, I welcome you to the discussion zone and we can talk about that as well. So with that being said, uh, that's probably the end of my material. So I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for coming and let me open the floor to questions. Hello, uh, thank you very much. Uh, yes, this slide, uh, I have seen asterisks near .NET Core support. Yep. Explain, please. Great question, thank you very much. Uh, so .NET Core support is something that I've been delaying in, uh, intentionally, and the reason for it is that um, one of the items that you see on the list is a bulk and batch operation support. And unfortunately, Microsoft screwed up SQL client implementation where they broke bulk and batch support for .NET Core. It's a known bug, they're aware of it, and they've promised, they've actually committed to fixing it in the next release of system.data.sql client that will be pushed to NuGet, and that they've already pushed a beta, and it works in beta, so I know it's working, uh, but uh, it hasn't been uh, released yet, so I'm just waiting for them to release it. So the second they release it, I will cut a new NuGet package and it will be fully supported. Thank you for the report. Uh, I want to ask uh, if there are any cases uh, when Entity Framework Core is preferred option than other or... Um... Good question. So the question is whether it's preferable or whether there are cases where it is preferable. And the answer is yes. And actually in the company that I work for, there are cases where we use a hybrid solution where we sometimes use Entity Framework for some needs and we use uh, uh, tiny ORM or a derivative of tiny ORM for other needs. So some of those cases obviously have to do with what uh, Entity Framework would do before you even get a query. So micro ORMs, they typically start when you already have a query, right? So Entity Frameworks helps a lot with its uh, link uh, compiling support, right? Where you have to build a query, and the reason why, you know, some simple queries might be preferred to be exposed as a link is that you get some additional benefits that you won't get with the text or with the parameterized query. And I'm primarily talking about things like uh, query composability, right? Where you can add the decorators to the queries, you can add filters, you can add sorters, you get composable behavior that you would not get otherwise with just a string, right? So most of the micro RAMs, actually all of the micro RAMs that I tested, included, um, including the entity framework, which I also tested in a micro ORM mode where entity frame was just executing a raw SQL, it was not building link. So there was, not, there was no linking vault in the test that I ran. So that's usually the number one case for preferring entity framework if you're dealing with something simple and you really value composability, entity framework might be a, a totally fine choice. Thank you. Somebody from this side, I'm gonna come to you. Okay, thank you. You said that uh, Tiny RM is managing full connection by yourself, yes? Yes. Okay, what's about uh, a leak of connection pools? For instance, my experience request is so sometimes we have uh, connection pool leaks in uh, server to database. Because so by connect default, it's one if I'm not mistaken, it's 100 connections. So connection pool settings are configurable, first of all, right? You can yeah, configure those things. But I think your question is specifically about leaks. Yeah, how, right? uh, how it's managing in your RAM uh, such case when you can just, for instance, uh, face it with uh, connection leak. Right, so the, the simple answer is that it doesn't, and the reason why it doesn't is because uh, tiny ORM, just like every other uh, micro ORM, so this is not specific to tiny ORM, defers all the connection management in terms of the upkeep of that connection, ensuring that that connection is not corrupt, it's still alive, and all those other internal things, internal connection housekeeping, uh, all micro ORMs defer all of that to ADO.NET. 
So Microsoft, for example, recently, I forget the version of .NET Framework, but they've recently added additional behavior, additional safeguards to ADO.NET, where ADO.NET connection pool internally detects the deterioration of the connection, of the actual internal connection to the SQL Server, uh, the deterioration of the pooled one, and it will automatically reconstitute one. So it will sunset the old corrupt one and create a new one without throwing anything or without exposing this to the API. So it's completely invisible and transparent. So TinyORAM does exactly what every other uh, microRAM does, and it simply just defers it to ADO.NET. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you for your performance. Uh, my question or just, I'm, I'm really curious, you decided to use a structure in TinyORAM to like uh, improve your performance, uh, but we everybody knows that structure has some complicity. You know, just for example, is it gonna be Copy it over time when we get it to when we get it to into some method, for example. Yeah, and in this case, we just get to keep in mind to use ref every time. Yes, and uh, it looks like uh, we should use it TinyRM in some specific, I guess, project because uh, just anybody can forget about that, and uh, I guess it will be uh, will add some pressure. Uh, on our system, mm -hmm. what do you think about that? So I think your question is that you're concerned whether or not uh, the fact that Tanya ORM uses a structure for its DTO, yes, whether exactly. it has some yeah. additional effects uh, or consequences which might be due to memory copying or additional structure copying, right? Yeah, exactly. But if you notice, uh, or one thing that you should notice about the structure that I'm using is that the structure is eight bytes long, right? Not 24 bytes, not 224 bytes, but just eight bytes long. So on a 64-bit system that we normally run, that's going to be a register-to-register -register copy, if that at all, right? So that's going to be as fast as you can probably make an operation on, in a 64-bit environment. So the structure itself is very slim, right? Plus, I'm not really engaging in any operation that heavily copied those structures around. So the structure is there just to get access to this data array, right? If you remember, the, the reason why it's eight bytes is because it's a pointer to the data array. Once I get that pointer, I'm not copying the structure anyway. Oh, okay, in this case, okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, so my question is, uh, what dat databases uh, does TinyORM support? Uh, does it support uh, Postgres, for example? Which one, sorry? Postgres, for Post example. Uh, because as I remember, Dapper is a, a database agnostic my, micro ORM. Thanks. All right, it's, it's not really database agnostic, but it supports multiple databases, right? So maybe the only database agnostic part of Dapper is the fact that Dapper extends IDB connection, which is database agnostic itself. Uh, but Dapper does support multiple databases. Tiny ORM, on the other hand, is a very razor focused tool. And the only database that it currently supports is a SQL Server. And my main reason for it is not due to some architectural constraint, but the fact that that's what I needed, that's what we work with, that's what my company works with, and that's what I needed first and foremost. We only use SQL Server and SQL Server exclusively, and uh, that's, that's what we had to implement, or I had to implement, and that's what ended up happening. Thank but you. when I say, sorry, when I say SQL Server, I'm talking about any SQL client consumable or accessible database. So it includes almost any version of SQL Server. It also includes Azure SQL. So database is a service that's running in the cloud, that's running in Azure cloud. Um, all of them are supported. Uh, hello, um, uh, thank you for the great talk. And the question is actually, uh, Continuation from the previous one: uh, Is uh, TinyRM available for extension? Can we uh, somehow uh, improve it to support different databases? Is it possible? Sure, good question. And maybe you know, a cute way of me answering that question is just to say that it has an MIT license and it's freely available on GitHub. In other words, you can do whatever you want with it, and it's only 700 lines of code. <laughs> so whether or not you can convince me that there is a particular extension that you want to add to the TinyRM the way I have it or whether you want to just fork it and do your own thing with it, it's your choice entirely. <laughs>